last Sunday, we actually had a youth leader meeting. So uh, all, of, all of us leaders, we kind of got together and we, we were talking about youth stuff and, and some pretty cool stuff. We had pizza, uh, which Jessica and I were on a low-carb diet, so um, we just had wings and we just rolled over their pizza. Um, and then they had the audacity to eat some of our wings, Sam more than anyone else. Anyway, all right, but we, we got to talking, and, you know, it, it was a pretty good meeting. Like, we were talking about youth stuff, about, you know, upcoming events, um, some, like, small groups we're doing in youth, uh, some discipleship stuff, you know, really, really kind of break down what we're doing in youth ministry and come up with a good plan, a good way to lead your students to know Jesus better, and, and, and suddenly the conversation just turned serious. It got really, like, dark, you know, and one of those moments when you're talking, all of a sudden you can hear, like, a pin drop, a debate started over a very serious topic. Which is better, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? I, I mean, I wasn't really even in this, because that's not, my, not really either of those are my category, but just, just for the sake of uh, to solve this debate, raise your hand if you think Star Wars is better. Oh, man, Sam, I think you lose. <laughs> All right. All right, raise your hand if you think Lord of the Rings is better. Okay. All right, all right. Um, Okay, so it was actually about even. Uh, most of everyone just doesn't care, so we were just talking about nothing. Okay, so <laughs> it's cool. And I would say that just for me personally, because of my age, like don't, don't hate me or anything. It's what I grew up with. I, I'm, I'm more of a Harry Potter fan. I know, I know this is church. I can't say stuff like that. But, but it came out when I was like 11. It ended when I was like 21. That was my childhood, right? Um, so th- that would be what, what I would say. But I think we can all agree on one series that trumps them all, right? I think we can all agree on, on one, like, fantasy series that is the greatest of all time. And that is none other than the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Can we agree? Can we just agree that is the best? It's, I mean, book-wise, anyway. Movies, you know. But the books were amazing, right? Okay, good. I'm glad we're all Christians here and we can say that the Chronicles of Narnia is the best, right? Because that's... I mean, it was written by C.S. Lewis. That makes it basically the Bible, right? Because C.S. Lewis wrote all the amazing stuff about the Bible. Um, so I, I would have to go out and say that the Chronicles of Narnia is the best. And uh, for that sake, I'm going to actually be uh, preaching from the magician's nephew. Don't worry, my Bible's over there. I'll use that too. I'm not a heathen. Um, but I do want to bring out a very interesting story in this. And, and these books are so good that I started studying for this, and I got Jessica interested in them and again, and in the last three days, she's read three of these books, like one book a day. I don't know where she's been. I haven't seen her in three days, but, but I hear the books are great, right? Um, but they, they are fantastic. So if you're not as familiar with the Bible of Narnia as I am, I'll give you a little backstory here on what's about to happen. Um, so this particular book, this is the first book. If you say anything different, you're wrong, okay? Um, backstory on that for those of you that didn't get it. This is the sixth book written, but when C.S. Lewis wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that was his only book he'd planned on writing. And then it was so popular, he kept writing and kept writing and kept writing until he wrote this, which is the prequel, but he did say in a letter to a kid that the correct order should be chronologically with the magician's nephew being first. That was a whole bunch of nerd history that you probably didn't care about, but you get it now. You're welcome. So The Magician's Nephew, the first book in the series, is about three main characters. We have Polly Diggory... Uh, their brother and sister, and then we have Uncle Andrew. Now, Uncle Andrew is a magician, hence the magician's nephew, right? So Uncle Andrew is a magician, and he's just, he's kind of like a cruel, really selfish guy. He's all about, you know, succeeding. He's all about looking out for, you know, numero uno. That's, that's all Uncle Andrew cares about. And, and in the story, Uncle Andrew creates these two rings. Now, he believes these rings. One ring will send the children to another world, and the other ring will bring them back. That is his theory. He then sends these children to another world, and they enter into uh, a world called Charn. And now while they're in Charn, everything is empty and everything is dead. There's nothing living there until, there's always an until in one of these stories, right? Until they wake up the evil queen, the, the, the witch of Charn who had destroyed the whole land, and her name is Jadis. Now, Jadis, being cruel and evil as she is, she wants to go back to um, Polly and Diggory's world and basically conquer it as well. 
Um, so she forces them to take her back to their world, and in a weird series of events, she like destroys most of the world, and uh, they, they get her back to Charn with Uncle Andrew, a random horse, and a cabbie. Um, they they kind of get them all back to Charn, and while they're in this other world, they're trying to escape from Jada, so they jump into a pond, and they enter into another world. Now, this is where the story gets good, right? You've read like three quarters of the book, but it gets real good right here. They enter into this other world, and all around them, all they can see is black. It's dark. There's nothing. But they begin to hear a faint song. Man, I'm just now thinking about it. It'd been cool if I had them play a song. Okay, but they start to hear just a really faint song, and it gets louder and louder, and they begin to say it's the most beautiful song they've ever heard, and it's the most beautiful voice they've ever heard, and as the song gets louder, they start to see things forming in the distance, and they see light happen, and they see grass come up, and trees form, and animals form, and water, and they, they see basically the creation of the world. We have Genesis in this chapter. like They have the creation of the world all the while the song is playing, and then they see where the song is coming from, and a large lion walks out. This lion's name is Aslan, and Aslan eventually comes up, and he, he talks to the children. And, and this is where we're going to pick up, because I think this is where it gets interesting. We're going to pick up when Aslan, the lion who just sung Narnia into creation, right, who just sung Narnia into creation, he approaches the children. We're going to look at it from Uncle Andrew's perspective, right? So it says, when the great moment came and the beast spoke, he missed the whole point, he being Uncle Andrew, for a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing long ago, when it was still quite dark, he had realized that the noise was a song. And he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. Then when the sun rose and he saw the singer was a lion, only a lion, he said to himself, he tried his hardest to make believe that it wasn't singing and never had been singing, only roaring as any lion might in a zoo in our own world. Of course, it can't really have been singing, he said. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? And the longer and more beautiful the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now, the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. Now, that's a life quote right there. The problem with trying to make yourself stupider is you very often succeed. Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he had wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Narnia, awake, he didn't hear any words. He heard only a snarl. Now, just a, a little while later, there's a point where Polly and Diggory's talking to Aslan. They, they go on a quest, some cool stuff happens, and they're talking to Aslan, and they say, you know, Aslan, can you please just speak to our uncle and make him not be afraid, and, you know, make him not want to come back here again. And, and this, is, this is that conversation. Please, Aslan, said Polly, could you say something to, to unfrighten him? And they could say something to present, prevent him from coming back here again? Do you think he wants to, said Aslan? Well, Aslan, said Polly, he might send someone else. He's so excited about the bar off the lamppost growing into a lamppost tree that he thinks that happens. You, you just have to read that to figure that part out. He thinks great folly, child, said Aslan. This world is bursting with life for these few days because the song with which I called it into life still hangs in the air and rumbles in the ground. It will not be so for long, but I cannot tell that to this old sinner, and I cannot comfort him either. He has made himself unable to hear my voice. If I spoke to him, he would hear only growlings and roarings. Oh, Adam's son, how cleverly you defend yourself against all that might do you good. But I will give him the only gift he is still able to receive. He bowed his great head rather sadly and breathed into the magician's terrified face. Sleep. He said, sleep and be separated for some few hours from all that torments you, all the torments you have devised for yourself. Uncle Andrew immediately rolled over with closed eyes and began breathing peacefully. Now, what I find so powerful about this is, yes, it, I believe it is a perfect representation of who God is, that when it says that Aslan looks sadly, 
because he's seen that Uncle Andrew can no longer hear his voice. I believe that's where God is. That, that, that is the character of God. God is so loving, God is so great, and God is so mighty, but he knows when we no longer hear his voice. But I think if we look close enough, we can see ourselves in those pages. And sadly, for a lot of us, myself included, a lot of times I can see myself more in the shoes of Uncle Andrew. That I get to where I can no longer hear the voice of God. That I've distanced myself so much that I can no longer hear the voice of God. And I think for so many of us, we can do that. Is that we can get to where we no longer hear the voice of God. Like, I, I, For example, during this series, Pastor Dennis has been revealing amazing mysteries of the Holy Spirit, and he's talked about prayer languages, and he's talked about receiving the Holy Spirit, and he's, he's talked about feeling things, and, and, and I don't know about you, and maybe this is just for me, but I know that I've went out and I've thought, I'm not feeling much. I hear these amazing stories. I see amazing healings. I see things happen in third world countries, and I hear preachers, and I, and I hear these amazing stories of casting out demons and, and dead people coming to life, and and I look at my own life, and I can't help sometimes but think I'm not seeing anything. And, and, and sometimes I'll go through the motions. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pray, and I'll sing, and I'll take notes, and I'll pray, and I'll sing, and I'll take notes. And I, you know, I do the, the Christianese things that I'm supposed to do, and sometimes I still don't feel anything. If you've ever been there, I don't know, maybe it's just for me. If you've ever been there, what do you think is more likely? Is it more likely that God is absent, or is it more likely that we've taken the posture of Uncle Andrew and we are no longer listening to his words? Which is more likely, that God is absent or that we're not listening, or that we're not listening? One of the most convicting sermons I've ever heard, Pastor Dennis, when we first started coming to church, he was going through a series on Romans. I'm sure many of you remember it. And I think very early on he preached, I, I believe primarily on Romans 124 because that's all I really remember. Um, but I remember him preaching on this scripture and it just suddenly hitting me and, and eventually convicting me of my own sin. Romans 124 reads like this. Come back here. This thing's not been my friend today. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. And I remember preaching very specifically on, therefore God gave them over to their sin. It's not exactly something we like to think of. God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. For the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator, who is forever and ever praised Amen. But I remember coming to a, what I believe was a shocking revelation for myself is that God, in Romans, it says God allowed them to remain in their sin. And it, it took a while for me to realize that the reason God would do such a thing is because God is a perfect gentleman, right? God is never going to force his will on you. Right? He, he's waiting for you. Right? You see, if you, you consistently choose sin, if you consistently go in the direction away from God, I think God is going to go, okay, child, that's not the right direction. That's not where you should go, but it's your choice. And God gave them over to their sins. And, and I can't help but think that in these moments where, where we feel nothing, where we experience nothing, and where we go through the actions we pray, sing, hope, pray, you know, we go through all the actions and we feel nothing, is there something holding us back? Is there something that God has given us over to? He says, child, you keep choosing that sin more than me. Okay, it's yours. How long have we chosen our sin over his spirit? How long have we chosen his sin, or 
How long have we chosen our sin over his spirit? So I want to I want to give just one little quote. Basically, sums up this entire message. That if you remember nothing else, that you write this down, you tweet it or something, and you remember this: We walk away from the spirit when we refuse to walk away from our sin. Right? We walk away from his spirit when we refuse to walk away from our sin. They are polar opposites. In the passage I'm going to read, you'll see they are polar opposites. You cannot walk both in the spirit and in sin. We are always choosing one or the other. So when we refuse to walk away from our sin, what we are really doing is walking away from God's spirit. And I'm not going to say this is always the case. I don't like generalities. But a lot of times when when I've spoken to people who who have left the faith for whatever reason, This is, again, not always the case. Everyone has their own unique story, but a lot of times, this is the case. That a lot of times, we love our sin, and we love our fun, and we love our freedom so much that we have dove in and fallen so far in love with it that we can no longer hear the voice of God. So yeah, God does seem like a myth because we can no longer hear his voice because we are so overcome in our own sin, that we are so overcome and so... All we can hear is the world and the fleshly desires that we've surrounded ourselves with. And again, I'm not going to say it's always the case, but a lot of people who left the faith that I've talked to, that seems to be the case, is they wanted the freedom to sin, whereas biblical freedom is freedom away from sin, not freedom towards sin. So how long have we chosen sin over his Holy Spirit? I want to read to you today the text I'm going to kind of park in and, and talk about is in Galatians 5, and Paul says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That one broke on me last time. One moment. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Get that. One more time. For the flesh... Flesh here, so if we break that down, what that Paul's really talking about is our sinful desires. So when you hear the word flesh, it's not flesh and bone, it's our sinful desires. Our sin desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the Acts, I think, is on here. Yep. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. Now, I have personally read this passage countless times did the Sunday school thing. I remembered the, my memory verse of love, joy, pace, or love, joy, peace, hope, kindness. I apparently didn't remember it very well. Um, but, you know, love, joy, peace. We all remember the fruit of the Spirit, right? Because that's the feel-good one, right? Because <laughs> we remember the fruit of the Spirit. But when you break down this passage, what Paul is doing is he's actually creating a comparison, You see, we have, yes, we have the fruit of the Spirit, but at the same time, we have the fruits of the flesh, right? And the word fruit here is less apples and oranges and more you have a harvest. You have a reaping. You you reap what you sow, right? So when Paul is saying the fruit of the Spirit, he's saying that you will have a harvest of the Spirit. When when he's talking about the fruits of the flesh, he's saying you will have a harvest of the flesh, that whatever we put in is what we're going to get back out, right? So if we're, if we're, getting the fruits of the flesh, if we're walking in the fruits of the flesh, then what are we going to get out? We're going to get sexual immorality, and we're going to get all these other things that it said on here. I'm sorry, I lost my place. But we are going to reap sexual immorality and impurity and debauchery, jealousy, envy. You know, 
selfishness. That's what we're going to get if we walk in the fruits of the flesh. And remember what it says. It says that the, the flesh is contrary to the spirit and the spirit is contrary to the flesh. Again, we cannot walk in both. We are always choosing one or the other. There is no way that you can sit in between because if you're walking towards sin, you're walking away from the spirit. If you're walking toward the spirit, you're walking away from sin. They are complete and total opposites. And whichever direction we go, whichever direction we walk, we are going to reap the fruits of that decision. Either we're going to reap the fruits of the flesh or we're going to reap the fruits of the spirit, which is love, joy, hope, kindness. We're going to be reaping one or the other. And we're always going to be moving toward one. And the problem we run into is that I heard it, uh, someone told me in first service that Calvin Wyatt used to say that sin is good for a season. And that's true. Sin can feel good for a season, right? And, and the world and the enemy is constantly going to tell us that sin is good and sin is fun and that if you want to succeed, if you want to make it, you've got to get cruel and you've got to get dirty and you've got to get sinful. The world is messed up, broken and cruel and you've got to be just as messed up, just as bad, just as cruel if you want to succeed. And the world is constantly filling our brains with this, that sin is normal and what is bad is good and what is good is bad and, and that if you are truly good, then you are actually conceited and you're judgmental. And But if you do the bad things, then you are good and you're walking with, with culture and that you're normal if you're doing these things, but if you try to follow God, you're abnormal, you're weird, you don't belong here. You see, the enemy is always trying to separate us from God. And how does he do that? He does it using sin. Now, this is my visual representation of sin for you. Um, for the record, this is cream soda, okay? Not beer. And I'll tell Pastor Dennis I was up here with beer and talking about Harry Potter, okay? Just cream soda, you get, you get the representation. It's supposed to be beer, but it's not, okay? Over here is my representation of sin. And over here, this is my representation of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice something. They are complete opposites. And when I'm over here, and when I'm in the Spirit, too close to the Spirit. <laughs> when I'm over here and I'm in the Spirit, when I'm pursuing the Spirit, when I'm walking in step with the Spirit, it's very real. I can feel it. I can embrace it. I know it's there. I can feel His presence. There is no denying what I feel at this very moment. I am full of the Spirit. The way that He is, if my hair didn't have so much product in it, it would be blowing all around, okay? The Spirit is real. The Spirit is present. I can feel Him totally. Now, I want you to notice on the opposite side of the spectrum, I have sin. That sin has always been there. It is always present, and it is always a temptation, and it always wants me to leave the Spirit and to come with to it. That is its desire. The enemy's desire is for me to leave the Spirit and go to the sin. Notice what happens. As I get up and I start to move away from the Spirit, his presence, that feeling, that overwhelming realness, it's less. And the further I walk away, the further I move towards sin, well, I, I can't feel it at all anymore. That the further we get into sin, the further we, we, we take in, the further we move toward the fruit of the flesh, the more we go toward the flesh, the more we choose the flesh, the more we choose our sinful desires over the desires of the Holy Spirit, We'll become like Uncle Andrew and we'll become deaf to the voice of God. Not because God isn't speaking. Know something, notice something else. The Holy Spirit has not moved. The Holy Spirit, when I walked away, didn't pack up his bags and go backstage and say, I'm done with this show. The Holy Spirit has always been there. The Holy Spirit's song is always singing. The Holy Spirit is always pursuing. He has not left. I have simply walked away. And, and if it had not been for the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit about my sin, I would probably still feel the, feel the Spirit. But the problem is when I choose sin, when I openly choose to sin, and I'm saying, this is what I want my life to be. This is what I want to do. I want to have fun. I want to make these decisions. I want to embrace these things. When I do that, I still feel and hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is I don't like being convicted. 
So, so often we'll start to tune out. Uncle Andrew says he heard the song, but he did not like the way the song made him feel. We won't like the way the Holy Spirit makes us feel when we are in sin. So we will tune out the voice of the Holy Spirit. We will tune out the voice of God until we no longer hear his voice and we become deaf to him. And it's all because of the direction I took. I could turn and walk back, but when I walk away from the Spirit, I just I can't feel it anymore. Because I'm so consumed with my sin. I'm so consumed. I, I, I'm so worried. I'm, I'm, I'm so entertained. I'm so, having so much fun for a season with my sin. You see, I think it's fascinating. Every time we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about being filled, right? That's a, that's a common trait, of talking about the Holy Spirit is that we are filled. And, and the Bible says that we are jars of clay, which is, is closely representative to our, you know, clear solo cups. That we are jars of clay filled with heavenly treasures. You see, what the problem is, is we are an empty vessel. And yeah, we can come over here and, and we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you see, we have the decision to also be filled with sin. We have the decision to pursue our sin over the Spirit. And when we pursue sin, a lot of times we'll become as bitter as vinegar, right? Because a lot of times when we're pursuing sin, our life isn't going the way we thought it would be. And a lot of times when we pursue sin, we become angry, right? We become hot and angry, and not hot in a good way, right? Like, we become angry and a lot of times we're angry at God. And we're like, God, where are you? God's like, I'm still over here. I'm waiting. But we come angry. And a lot of times, the further we get into sin, the less fight and drive we have to fight against temptation. So most times we succumb, again, cream soda. A lot of times we will succumb to sin and succumb to our temptation. And, and we'll make moral failures and faults. Because that's what sin does. But then part of, one of the worst things is that we become so consumed with this world that we soon become where we make no time for God. We're so consumed with the things we have to do that we soon stop making time for God and we run out of energy because we've burnt up all our energy reserves on all the other things we have to do and didn't focus on God. And so we're just simply out of energy. And then through all this, when we... When we are in sin, we'll very often just become sour. When something's sour, it's, have you ever had milk go sour? It's not good. It's good for nothing, right? So often we are just so encompassed with sin. We get to a place where we're just, we're just sour. And when you combine all that sin, because we are vessels, the Bible clearly says we are vessels, that we are full of something. And we have the choice. We can, we can continue to fill ourselves with sin and we'll end up with something like this. That's not good. That is not good at all. This is what sin looks like. This is... what sin feels like. Not good. Don't worry. I brought an Altoid in case you wanted to pray with me afterwards. Uh, that's not good, guys. I'm going to be straight up. That was bad. That was worse than first services. I had a little more vinegar in that one. So, yeah, it's bad. Sin is bad, guys. I, I, I did that for you, all right? <laughs> so that you would know <laughs> Someone try it, just see if it's as bad as I say. So that you would know what sin feels like. See, sin is bad. And like it leaves a taste in your mouth. And I don't think we get rid of that. Like it is just there. It is constant. And guys, it's bad. It seems good for a season. It seems good for a moment. It seems fun. But it will always leave you broken, damaged, and with a bad taste in your mouth. 
That is simply what sin does. But so often, this world and the enemy, it tries to convince us that sin is good, that sin is normal, that sin is necessary, that sin is just what you do. And so often we fall in that trap and we pursue sin over the spirit. So often we pursue our sin over the spirit. And again, guys, it'll leave you empty and broken with a bad taste in your mouth. And it tries to convince us that it is what is good. It is what is necessary. It is what is holy. And we often think that in order to succeed, in order to make it, we have to kind of lean that way. But in Mark 8.36, it says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their souls? What good is it for us to succumb to sin, to keep going with sin, and forfeit our souls? Now, the Holy Spirit is still present. It's just a little loud. What good is it for us to gain the entire world, but forfeit our souls? You see, because we get into this this thought process that we need more and more and more and more. And it always leads to sin because we're trying to fill our desires with ungodly things. And we think we need more and more and more. And we think we need, you know, that promotion and that job and that boat. And, you know, we think we need all these things, but it'll never be enough. We will never be able to fill our vessels and fill complete if we only put in Sin. Sin is not good. It's actually quite bad. And it will leave you, even in the moment, it feels like so much fun and it feels so natural and necessary, but it will leave you empty and broken. That is just what it does. You see, but I understand that overcoming sin is not easy. Trust me, this this message was brought not because I thought you guys needed it, but because I knew I needed it. I know that sin is not easy to overcome. But Wednesday night, during youth, we showed a video. In this video, they talked about the three steps to overcoming um, sexual sin. But as I listened, I thought it was so relevant and so applicable to this message here today that I was up until like 1 a.m. writing it. And it's cool, there was enough energy drinking that to get me through, I think. But there's a three-step process, three very steps to help you overcome sin. And I want to go through them right now. The first one is hate it. We have to learn to hate our sin. I'll be real with you, I hate that. All right? We've got to learn to hate our sin. Now, I want to tell you a story about someone I know. I'm not going to use any names. I'm going to be very general here. But a, a close friend of mine used to love smoking. That was their thing. They loved cigarettes. That they loved smoking until one day, every time they would smoke a cigarette, they would get deathly sick. Like vomiting, the whole thing, just sick. As you can imagine, it did not take long for this person to start to hate cigarettes in which it made quitting very easy. And we, it comes to find out that a very close friend was actually praying that they would begin to get sick every time they smoked a cigarette. A prayer was answered, and we all need a friend like that, right? But when we learn to hate our sin, and it's hard, I know it doesn't feel natural because a lot of times we've come to love our sin. We've come to love our actions, love the things that we're doing because in that season, they're fun. But if we could just look at it and say, what's that doing to me? What is that doing to my character? What's that doing to who I am? What would that do to my loved one if they knew? What would happen if all my friends and peers knew about that sin that I'm hiding in the dark? What would happen What if we asked ourselves, what is the reality of this sin? What what is it actually doing? What is it actually accomplishing? Is there anything positive coming from these decisions I'm making? Do I realize that that sin put Jesus on the cross? If we can come to hate our sin, we're one step further in overcoming it. The next step is that we've got to starve it. 
Now, starving it is incredibly practical. It's, in the Bible, it says that the path or the road to destruction is wide and the gates are open. What we're trying to do when we're starving our sin is we're trying to create a roadblock in that path of destruction. We are very mean, really meaning put a physical barrier in our path. And for you, that may be looking like deleting social media, at least temporarily deleting the internet. Or it could be to quit hanging out with those friends that every time you're with them, you do something stupid. It could be leaving that significant other that's always pressuring you. You just guys can't get past the temptation. This is very real. If you were going to starve out your sin, listen, you, you cannot defeat something you are constantly in. Right? You cannot defeat sin if you're constantly living and walking in that sin. You've got to learn to separate yourself from this. And this is where it gets very practical because Jesus says that we are to flee from temptation. And this is that part, and it's not cowardice to actually put in physical roadblocks just because you don't have the strength to do it on your own. Guess what? Jesus knew we didn't have the strength to avoid sin. We don't. Sin is powerful. Sin is addictive. We've got to find a way to starve out that sin so that we can start back on the path of righteousness. That is what we must do. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's, it's simply finding Someone that you can talk to that, that'll call and check on you every day and just say, hey, how are you doing? Maybe that's joining one of these small groups we got going on where you'll be surrounded with people that love you and care for you and that, that they'll help you through whatever it is you're going through. Maybe it's talking to your spouse or your parent. I don't know what that looks like for you, but find your individual way to starve out your sin. What physical barriers can you put, really physical, not a thing in your head, what real barriers can you put between you and that sin? Find it and implement it. The final step is outsmart it. Now, I will be honest with you. This is the only one that we cannot do alone. The other two, they depended on us to hate that sin, to starve out that sin, this one, it is not possible to outsmart sin. It is not possible to outsmart the enemy. The enemy in sin has a lot more experience than you. They've been doing this thing a whole lot longer than you. You can't do it. I know, it's an inspirational message. What you must do, what we must do, is go to the one who can. You see, there is only one that can outsmart sin. He's the same one who is the only one who defeated sin. That we must go to God and learn to outsmart our sin. You see, because we ultimately are vessels filled with sin. That we have made these decisions and we have become full of something. We've become full of sin. And the process of outsmarting sin looks simply like this, that we are a filled up vessel full of sin. But instead of remaining that vessel full of sin, we start to let the Holy Spirit pour into us. And we start to be filled not with sin, but with the Holy Spirit. And we do that with everyday decisions, with everyday movements, with everyday actions that today we're gonna pray a little more. And today we're gonna read our Bible a little more. And today we're gonna talk to someone about that sin we've been having. Today we're gonna open our minds to the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that we're going to do this step, step at a time. I'm telling you, this is not a sprint. It is a marathon. But we constantly become filled with the Holy Spirit. That we constantly let the Holy Spirit pour into us. And that we constantly seek and pursue. And again, it's not going to happen in one day. It's going to be a lifelong journey. But if we keep taking in the Holy Spirit, if we keep letting the Holy Spirit pour into us, if we keep in his word, if we keep praying, if we keep pursuing, if we keep walking away from our sins and instead walking toward the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> very soon, we're not a vessel of sin. Sorry, guys, that vinegar smells awful. And I'm not saying we're gonna be perfect. We're not Jesus. And there's probably gonna be some times that we're gonna pour some more sin into this 
and we're gonna mess up and we're gonna fail, that's not the end of the race. When you get saved, when you accept Jesus, it's not over, it just began. We have to keep pursuing and keep filling. We have to let our vessel overfill. We have to let the Holy Spirit pour into us until we are pouring into everyone else because the Holy Spirit flows out of us so much but that we can't help but overfill into those around us. And guess what? That's good. That's refreshing. That's much different than what filled this container just moments ago. That is the complete opposite of what filled this container just moments ago. We are vessels of sin, but we must not remain vessels of sin. That is not the call and the plea of Jesus on our life. No, God has a purpose. God has a plan. We are not meant to remain in sin. Yes, there are times where we will fail and we will mess up, but that is not the intention. The intention is that we will flee from sin and we will pursue the Holy Spirit. That is the intention and that is the possibility. And that is what God wants for our lives, that we will not remain in sin. Yes, we will mess up. None are perfect. Remember, Jesus died not because we were perfect little happy humans. Jesus died because we were broken, messed up, sinful creatures. That is why Jesus died, but Jesus died so that we would not remain that way. Jesus died so that we would not be vessels of sin. Instead, we would be vessels of righteousness, that we could take his spirit, that we could accept his spirit, that we could follow him, and we could do amazing things through him. That is why Jesus died, was to cleanse our sin, not for us to remain in them. Yes, we have messed up. Yes, we have made mistakes. Yes, we have sinned, but we are not intended to remain in that sin. That was never the intention for our lives. We were called for a greater purpose than that. We were called to not be deaf to the voice of God, but to flee from our temptation and to pursue the Spirit with everything we have. And that looks very practically like reading your Bibles and praying. And every time something happens, when you lose your glasses, you go to God in prayer. And every time something goes on, every time a friend has a problem, every time life happens, we go to God in prayer and we go to Him in His Word and we are constantly filling ourselves. Our vessel is constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. It is then that we are no longer a vessel of sin, but we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is then that I believe that we will hear the voice that has been there the whole time. It is then that we will receive His Spirit. We will get His gifts. It is then that we will be able to listen and understand. And I'm sorry if this message seemed mostly negative, but I had to get us through that until we could get here so that we could understand this thing is that none are perfect, none are broken. I'm sorry, but none of our cups look like this. Our cups probably look a little more like this. And we're trying and we're fighting. But I know for so many of us, we think that we have messed up too much that we are too far gone, that our vessels are too full of sin, that there is no redeeming us, that maybe we don't even hear the voice of God anymore and that's because God has abandoned us. But the Bible says that God will never leave you nor forsake you. He has not left your presence. He is still there waiting for you to turn back. His voice is still ringing. His song is still playing. He is still crying out for you, child. Turn away from your sin and follow me. That is what the Holy Spirit is all about is for you to turn and to follow him. That you would turn and you would come to Jesus, no matter your sin, no matter your pain, no matter your imperfections, no matter what you've done, God has never left you, nor will he ever forsake you. He knows who you are. He had a plan and a purpose for your life before you were born. That is who you are, because our God is that amazing. For us to fulfill our calling, all we've gotta do is turn from our sin and pursue Jesus and pursue the Holy Spirit. I just want you to know wherever you're at, whatever this vessel looks like, you're not too far gone. God has a purpose. God has a calling. However full of sin you think, however impossible you think it is that you'll make it out of this moment, know that you're not too far gone, that the Holy Spirit is still present. He is the God of now. I know so often we think it would have been amazing to walk with Jesus. And I can't wait until I get to heaven and I'm walking with the Father. Yet we have the God of now here in our presence with us. The Holy Spirit is not waiting to meet us. He is in our midst with us. He's waiting to come into us for us to follow him. He is is that God of now. 
that he is here with us and he is waiting for you and you are never too far gone. I know that sin can seem like it's impossible to overcome, like you'll never get it right, you'll never get it together. I'm just too broken, I messed up, that's just who I am. That is not who you are. You are a child of the living God and he loves you and he is pursuing you and he is waiting for you. What the Holy Spirit does, even when we are in the midst of sin, he waits patiently, he pursues diligently, and he forgives completely. That is who God is. And I want you to know, wherever you are on this spectrum, that you are not forgotten. However messed up it seems, however broken you feel, however overpowered you feel, it's not over. God is with you and God is on your side. Turn away from your fleshly desires, turn away from what is contrary to the spirit and pursue God. He loves you and he wants that relationship with you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for these words. God, I pray today over everyone here that you would lay your spirit on them, Jesus, that you would give them strength, you would give them courage, that we would have the power and the strength and the will, God, to to hate our sin, to starve that sin, and Lord, to pursue you, to outsmart that sin, that we would go each and every day, each and every moment, we would continually fill ourselves with you so that we would not be a vessel of sin. Instead, Lord, we would be a vessel of your Holy Spirit to the amount that it pours out and that we go out making, making disciples of all nations, that your spirit overflows out of us to such an extent that those around us can help but feel it, to experience it, to know your presence just because they came into contact with us, that when our shadows fall over people, they feel your presence. Lord, I pray that you would fill us. God, that you would use us. God, help us to build your kingdom. Lord, you know our pains and our struggles. You know what we're going through today. Lord, I pray that you would lay your spirit of comfort on each and every person here. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name.